open house. We welcome everyone. We take care of each other and we help people in need. As we begin, I have a few announcements that I want to share with everybody. The first is that I would like to give everyone an update on the summer lunch program that's been going on this year. At this point, we have given out 1,900 lunches this year, which is a, a very large improvement on last year, or an increase on last year. Uh, so let's, uh, let's maybe we clap for that. And say, praise God for this community, and thank you to all of the people who have helped out, who have volunteered, who have donated, who have brought in uh, lunches and vegetables and all of the wonderful things that have happened to this congregation. Uh, we're not done, and we need your help. At, we're having another packing session on Tuesday from 1.30 to 2.30, so if you've got a little bit of time on Tuesday afternoon, please come on by and help us pack up lunches. This is an all-ages kind of thing. Anybody can do it. Um, all it takes is, uh, is the ability to, to grab something off the table and put it into a bag. So it's, uh, it's a pretty easy thing, but we definitely need to make it happen because we have a lot more lunches to give over the next few weeks. Um, second, I want to say uh, thank you to everybody uh, who helped organize and work on uh, our potluck with Camden Hispanic Fellowship and uh, Beth Dell Presbyterian Church from Vineland. We had a wonderful turnout yesterday. I think we had maybe 60 people. Um, probably, probably half from our congregation and half from the, the other two congregations. And we heard a uh, powerful testimony about what God is doing in people's lives. How much uh, God has been faithful to people who have come here uh, from a long way away looking for and hoping for opportunity and peace and the challenges that they face uh, as immigrants. And so uh, we had a wonderful event. It was delightful. It was such a blessing. And I hope that we'll get to uh, come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, more often in the future. We'll, we'll look at, at how we can plan something else uh, in the same vein. And I'm hopeful we're going to plan to go out um, and join Canyon Hispanic Fellowship for worship sometime in the fall. So uh, once, I, once I figure out what the date is, then I'll pass it on to you guys. Uh, finally, uh, I have some bad news. Lloyd Hyde, a longtime member of this church, had a very large stroke on Saturday morning. Uh, he's uh, not expected to live much longer, and so if we could uh, keep Lloyd in our prayers and keep Etta and Jamie and Jeff and his whole family in our prayers for this time. And uh, are there other announcements? Early. I'm going to say that with the microphone just so everybody can hear. We have third meal on Tuesday evening. It will be uh, hot, so don't cook in your kitchen. Come and join us for dinner. And remember that one of the most important aspects of this ministry is just sitting down and eating with our neighbors. We have a lot of people who come to help, and that's wonderful. But the practice of rubbing elbows with the people around us is one of the most profound things uh, that we can do. It was a huge part of Jesus' ministry to just walk around and share meals with, you, with other people. And, and that's one of the things that we call people to do. So please join people at tables, sit with them, talk to them, share your life and share their lives. Uh, because that's where the Holy Spirit meets us. Jen?
our sins, who could stand? But with God there is forgiveness, steadfast love, and great power to redeem. Hope in the Lord, it is God who will save us from our sin. With faith and hope, let us confess our sin, first together as a community, and then personally, in silence. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too ill to die, and too deep to undo. Hear the good news. Hope does not disappoint us, for God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
are you guys today? <laughs> hot? Yeah. So I have a question for you. Okay. So how many of you helped with the angel bar out front? The vegetables? Did you guys help plant things? You helped plant a garden, okay. So what are the good? So what kind of things do you do for a garden? Mm-hmm. You have to get the water. Okay. Um, do you have to sometimes put like a fence around it to keep the animals out? Because they like to eat it too. Okay. Well our school I know they do. I know, that happens. So our story today is from Isaiah 5, and it's not about a vegetable garden, but a vineyard. So who knows what we grow in a vineyard? Mint. Mint? Do you know in a vineyard? Have you ever gone to buy? There's one out Route 322, along the side. So what do we grow? Grapes. Great. So, while we're talking about our story today, I brought you some grapes. And for the kids that are under four, we have cut up grapes. <laughs> Just in case. Okay, so you can pass them around. I think everybody else is older, that we don't have to worry about that. Okay, so you can you can chew up a grape if you want to show it, right? Well, I gave you cut up ones, just in case. <laughs> so our story today is about a man who plants a vineyard. So he does everything that he thinks is good. He picks nice fertile ground, and he picks good vines, and he puts a fence around it to keep the animals out, and he makes sure it gets water, but when it's time to harvest the grapes, guess what? They're not good ones like the ones you have. They're called wild grapes. And wild grapes are little, small, hard grapes that are sour and sort of smell funky. So, I wonder why. So like some of the stories in the Bible, it's meant to, to teach us a lesson. And this one's sort of hard. This one was hard for me. But the lesson is that the man who was planting, planting the vineyard was actually God, and the vines were the people of Israel. So sometimes, in order to produce good fruit, we have to do the right thing, right? We have to make good choices. So that's the lesson of the story today. God always loves us. And he always wants to give us the things we need to do to produce good fruit. But it also means that we have to make the right decisions and pick the right choices. So will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for always giving us what we need. Thank you for always giving us what we need. To produce good fruit. Help us to make the right choices. Help us to make the right choices. And do what is right. And do what is right. Amen. Amen. It's time for you to depart.
But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants, and give the vineyard to others. So we've got, uh, we've only got one other scripture reading written uh, in the bulletin, but I have two that I'd like to share. Um, the next reading is, come, is going to come from the book of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and then we'll go back to Isaiah. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, but it is apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Our next reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem, people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I shall break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall not be overgrown with briar, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the people of Judah are his pleasant tenting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. This is the word of the Lord. I read three passages today because all of them share a central metaphor, this idea of the people of God as a vineyard and God as the vine grower. And when we read the, the passage in Mark and the passage in John, they are rooted in and connected to this earlier parable that shows up in Israel. And all of them are about what it means to bear good fruit, about what God expects of us. And so when we think of the, the John passage, I'm the vine and you are the branches, and when we think of the, the parable of the vineyard, uh, in which we hear that the stone was rejected as it become the chief cornerstone, we should be thinking of Isaiah. We should be thinking of this, this moment, or this parable, really, that Isaiah tells about cultivating a vineyard that then grows wild grapes. So the, the metaphor that we have in this Isaiah passage is God is the vine grower, 
and God has, has done everything God could do to cultivate good grapes. God, God cleared all the rocks out of the soil, God tilled the soil, God planted choice vines with, with very good genes. Uh, God set up a, a hedge around it to protect the vineyard. God set up a watchtower and a, a wine vat, and God did everything there was to do to raise good grapes. Is there anything else God could have done? No. But the grapes that grew were wild grapes. That is, God did everything God could, but the grapes grew as if God had done nothing at all. As if there had been no cultivation, as if there had been no hedge, no tilling, no choice vines, no wine vat, and no watchtower. All that work that God put in was for nothing. They remembered nothing of what God had done, but instead grew wild and went off in the directions they wanted to go. And the consequence that, that God proclaims in response is a sort of poetic justice, right? If cultivation produces wild grapes, then God will no longer cultivate. God will remove the hedge and the watchtower. God won't plant choice vines anymore. God won't hoe and till the soil. It seems like God seems to be saying, if you want to grow wild, grow wild. You don't need my help to do that. And so, sometimes we think of this as, as a really, um, like a, a divine punishment passage or a divine threat passage. But we might more clearly think of it as free will. That is, if the grapes want to grow wild, God will let them grow wild. What God is doing is leaving the people to the tyranny of their own choices. Sometimes what feels like divine punishment is simply the end of the path that we have blazed for ourselves. But I want us to be careful when we're talking about divine punishment because it's so easy for it to go wrong for us. Uh, we are on the, well, I guess we're in the middle, but I, I know hurricane season starts uh, getting a lot hotter coming up. And every time there is some sort of a natural disaster or some sort of a man-made disaster, some jerk comes out of the woodwork and proclaims that this was God's punishment on somebody. And, and he, I'm not going to pretend like it's, it's not always a man, and almost always a man, who reflects very poorly on my profession, uh, will we'll just happen to know the exact reason that God is punishing somebody. And that reason almost always exactly coincides with that particular preacher's pet issue, that particular preacher's a uh, thing that they think is wrong. This, this comes up, and it, and it doesn't matter what the situation is. In the, in the past few years, New York has been condemned for the exact same things going on in Tulsa, Mobile, and New Orleans, and Miami, vastly different places that all apparently have the same exact sin at their heart. And somebody is here to tell us that they know exactly what's going on. I suspect if, if the roof uh, of their own home was torn off, it would be an unfortunate tragedy. Uh, or maybe even a case of mistaken identity on God's part. <laughs> but when it happens to somebody else, there's always somebody who's there to say, this is God's punishment for that. Never mind that, that God doesn't tend to use collective Never mind that passage that we read four or five weeks ago in which Abraham talked to God about Sodom and Gomorrah and said, if there's even one righteous person, person in it, God will stay God's hand. Never mind all that. We know exactly what God is doing. Now, I want to tell you that there's something faithful in this, and there's something faithless in this, and there's something dangerous in this. In this talking about natural disasters as God's punishment for other people doing something wrong. Uh, now here's the faithful thing. We're going to start with the good news. The faithful thing is these men believe that God cares about what is going on down here. And they believe that God is going to do something about what is going on down here. And there are plenty of Christians who simply don't expect God to do anything about injustice, unrighteousness, sinfulness and wickedness. And these guys, they have hung on to that, that biblical declaration 
that God hears and God cares about what's going on in this world. And this is something that we've got to hang on to. If we believe in a God that brought people out of the land of Egypt and into freedom, then we've got to believe that God cares about what's going on in our world now. If we believe in a God that freed the people from Babylon by sending Cyrus to release them from the exile, then we've got to believe that God cares about what's going on now. If we believe in a God who brought Daniel safely through the lion's den, we've got to believe that God can bring us safely through what's going on now and will reward our faithfulness and punish the wickedness of the world. And that's, that's faith. Now what's dangerous, though, is, is conflating our voice with the voice of God. That's a, that's a risky proposition. Whenever we do that, we are, are flawed, we're sinful people. And, and the truth is that, that nobody can compete with humans on capacity for self-deception. We are very good at convincing ourselves that what we want is what God wants, or what God wants is what we want. We are amazingly good at convincing ourselves that what God wants most in the whole world is for us to do exactly what we've always done, or do exactly what we want to do. And so it's really, really easy for us to mix up God's opinions and our opinions, God's enemies and our enemies. And more darkly, this can lead us to believing that we ourselves are God's chosen instruments of divine punishment and advocating for or enacting violence against our neighbor. When you look at the major failures of Christianity, when you look at the, the times in which Christians have done horrific acts of violence towards other people, like the extermination of native peoples in this country, the colonial contract, uh, conquests and the abuse and enslavement of Africans, the Crusades, they all have this in common. People convince themselves that this is what God was wanting them to do. Now that doesn't mean that we can't talk about what God wants in the world, right? We, we have to be able to, to know and, and, and share with each other that there are things that God wants us to do, there are things that God doesn't want us to do. There is right and there is wrong, and we need to be able to say that. It just means that when we set ourselves up to talk about what God wants and what we want, we've got to be really, really careful that we aren't exposing our backside. We've got to stay grounded in the Word of God. We've got to stay firmly rooted in a community of faith, of, of people that surround us, that can help us to stay on the right track, people with more experience than we have, people with more vision than we have. And we've got to stay humbly praying for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So that's what's dangerous. What's faithless about those folks that come out and, and proclaim that this hurricane or that mass shooting was, was God's condemnation on this city for its tolerance of, of, of whatever, is that they have found a way to obsess over mint, dill, and cumin while neglecting the weightier matters of the law. And that quote in the bulletin, um, you'll, you'll see it's from William Sloan Coffin. That comes from the sermon he gave in 1986 about AIDS, which people were saying at the time was God's punishment against people uh, who were same-sex attracted for sinfulness. And, and he says it so much better than I can, but if, if we get ourselves into, into believing, if we, if we believe that God cares so much about sex that God will destroy New Orleans with a hurricane, that God won't lift a finger to stop arms dealers or pill pushers or war makers or destroyers of God's creation, then we have made an idol out of a cruel caricature of God. This is not the God that loves everyone. This is not the God that taught us to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is not the God who so loved the world that he gave his only son that we might live. This is something else. So as, as, we, as we think about sort of divine punishment, we want to be careful uh, that we are respectful of what God wants. We're listening to our community around us, and we are humbly prayerful that we are on the right path. And remember what Lincoln said, that we don't pray that 
God is on our side. We pray that we might be found on God's side. So I want to I uh, call our attention to the last two verses from that passage in Isaiah because there's a pun in it. And I am a new, newish dad, and so now I love puns. If you love dad jokes, you will love the Bible in Hebrew. It's full of puns. It, it says... For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, that is in Hebrew mishpat, but saw blood, bloodshed, that is in Hebrew mishpat. So he expected mishpat, he got mishpat. He expected righteousness, that is tzedakah, but he heard a cry, that is tzedakah. Justice is what he expected, he got Bloodshed, mishpat, mishpak. Righteousness is what he expected, but heard the cry, tzedaka, tzedaka. I'm telling you, dad jokes is full of that. <laughs> but what it, it tells us, and, and this is a, a thread that runs through the entire Bible, and especially in the prophets, is, is there are two big things that God cares about, and that is justice, and that is righteousness. Right? When we look at the Bible, we look at the condemnations of the prophets, there's, there's two things that the people of God get in trouble for. The first is not caring for their neighbor. That is justice, right? That it is leaving their neighbors to starve while they happily drink wine in the palaces of the king. That is justice. And the second is righteousness. That is forsaking God in favor of idols. It's, it's about our relationship with God, we can think of that as a vertical line, and our relationship with our neighbor, we can think of that as a horizontal line. And these were the, the, the problems that, that came up, these were the, the heart of the problems that came up for Israel, these were the heart, the heart of the problems that, came, uh, that come for us now. The way that God puts it in Deuteronomy 6, 5 is, You shall love the Lord your heart, with your, your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And these are the two great commandments that Jesus gave us, right? Jesus reminded us of that commandment from Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your strength. And then the second is like it. Is like it. Jesus said, quoting Leviticus 19, 18, that golden rule, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, when it comes down to it, the two great things that God expects from us to bear good fruit are to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbors. The people of Israel were terrible at this. They trusted their gated communities to help them. They, they trusted their ties to powerful people to connect them, their, their work ethic, or their bank accounts. They worshipped whoever everybody else was work, worshipping or whoever seemed like they would get the job done. But what God wanted from them is trust. God wanted them to remember all of those times that God had been there for them, all of those times that God had pulled them through the valley of the shadow of death, and to hang on to God and not toss God away in favor of the next new thing. And the next expectation that God gives us is, is to care for our neighbor. This is throughout the Bible, but especially in the prophets, and especially early in Isaiah, who, who excoriate the people for forgetting the poor. The first chapter, Isaiah says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. So, so when we start to think about what God means when God is talking about us bearing good fruit, what God's talking about in Isaiah, what God's talking about in John, what God's talking about in Mark, it's these two big things, it's these two great commandments that Jesus gave, gave, gave us, that, that vertical line, right, our relationship with God, our, our putting our trust in God, making sure that there's nothing that separates us from the love of God, and then that horizontal line, that relationship with each other. Now, I, I just want you guys to take a, a second to look around the space and time. Is there anywhere in here that there's a horizontal line and a, and a vertical line? They're all close to each other. <laughs> it's behind me, isn't it? Right, the, the cross. Oh, yeah, in here. This is maybe bigger, right? 
So, so here we have, we've got the vertical line, that is, that is, this is our relationship with God, we've got the horizontal line, and this is our relationship with the neighbor. And what the cross tells us is that these two lines are connected. That is, there's a relationship between how we care for our neighbor and how we listen to and obey our God. And when we, when we look at the Bible as a whole, when we start to look at what are the commandments of God, what are the laws of God, they have to do with how do we treat our neighbor, how do we make sure that we live in harmony with each other, as in solidarity with each other, as a family with each other. And, and they talk to us about how we live in relationship with God. And ultimately, that is the, well, maybe the summation of Jesus' ministry is, is Jesus is, is God who came down to us, God who chose to care about our neighbors, God who chose to teach us to care about our neighbors, and ultimately, a God who chose to love the world so much that he died that we might know how to live with each other. God died in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed and the suffering, so that we might know that whenever we are poor and oppressed and suffering, that, that is where God is. And whenever somebody else is poor and oppressed and suffering, that is where we should go if we want to be where God is. The cross and what it represents, this, this notion, this metaphor of bearing fruit, is about keeping these two ourselves and for each other. It's about loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. It's about remembering that our relationship with God can't be separated from our relationship with our neighbor. So ultimately, this, these passages about vines and vineyards, these words about bearing good fruit, about what God expects us for, means aligning ourselves vertically, with what God is doing, loving the Lord our God with our heart, with all our mind, with our strength, and not putting anything in between ourselves and God, and then aligning ourselves horizontally, loving our neighbors as ourselves. It's that simple. It's that complicated. It's what God said to us in my prayer, what shall we do? What shall we pray with the Lord? You shall love the Lord your God. Wait a minute. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's what we're talking about when we talk about bearing good fruit for God. It's these two things, it's keeping ourselves lined up both vertically and horizontally, that in everything we do, we do not forget God and we do not forget God. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Spirit. Please stand and join me in the affirmation of faith as printed in the I believe in God.
Right. All right. So we're going to wait just a second. While we do, uh, I'm going to say that we baptized somebody last week. Uh, and when we baptize a child or an adult, we make promises to that child. This one here is one of those that we promises. And we proclaim that we are going to be God's love for them. We're going to teach them about Jesus. We're going to teach them how to, to grow and um, learn and have a foundation of Christ. And those commitments that we make in baptism don't end. They are always our commitments and always our faithfulness. And so Meredith and Aiden, as you go forth from this place, we want you to know that we love you we care about you with all our hearts, and we will always be home for you, no matter where you are. And we have uh, these boxes uh, that we wanted to send you off with. This is this is me, and this is Meredith, and these just have uh, notes of encouragement and appreciation that, as you go forth from this place, whether you're going somewhere near or going somewhere far, that you know that we support you, we care about you, and we. To uh, bless you in any way that we can. Uh, so, uh, as you go forth from this place to, to do things, I, I know Mary's been sticking around pretty close. Hey, where are you at? Oh, our St. Jesus. Okay. Uh, so, you're also sticking around really close. So, we'll, we'll be delighted that we get to see you again and again over the coming months and years. But as we make this big transition in your lives, we just want to offer up a prayer. So, can we all bow our heads in prayer together? Loving God, we bless Aiden and Meredith and Savannah to go from this place and follow your call to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. May they be witnesses to your love and grace in everything that they do. Give them the faith that will light their way and the wisdom to choose right paths. Surround them with communities of support and love that strengthen them to do your will. May they know the love of God through this place, no matter where they go. May we never forget them and the ways that they have blessed this congregation. May we love them and support them in following your call. God ask the Lord to support them, strengthen them, and encourage them to face the challenges that they will grow to face. And whether they are near or far, Lord, may you hold them and all of us in the palm of your hand. Aiden, Meredith, as you go from this place, may you remember that you always have a home here, full of people who will welcome you and care for you no matter what.
and all of those who have no one to pray for them. We lift them all up to you. Be their rock and their refuge. Wrap them in your arms and fill them with your love and with your kiss. We pray as well for all who have died that they have a place of rest and peace in you. And we pray all of these things, hoping and yearning and working, that we might bear good fruit and live our lives in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name, or who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven,